Hello and welcome along to the Panto Podcast. This week my guest is Joseph Hodgkinson. We talk about becoming a baddie, those eyebrows, having a theatre sleepover, and how to deal with divas. So please sit back and enjoy the latest Panto Podcast. My guest on today's Panto Podcast is Joe Hodgkinson. Hello, Joe. Hello. How are we doing? Yeah, very good. And good. thank you very much for spending the time to speak to us. So you're best probably known now as a baddie. I'd say so, uh, yeah. Of a villain. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say I'm quite a good villain. I'm good at being bad. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But like most baddies, and this isn't taking it away from the nice people in pantomime, but uh, the baddies are normally the ones who are some of the very nicest, most gentle most nicely well-mannered people yeah i'd absolutely agree with you uh, yeah all the baddies i've met have all been really lovely people and normally very shy people too mm. you know is it like an expression then when you get out on the, when you've got the costume on and... uh, yeah yeah i think you get out there and you think about all the people that have naffed you off <laughs> over the years <laughs> and you kind of just let all your uh Anger and frustration out on the <laughs> on the poor actors that you share in the stage with, <laughs> and the children, of course. And the, oh God, absolutely! The amount of children I've made cry. Have you? <laughs> yeah, not intentionally. It's just my face, I think. <laughs> so when did it begin then for you? Did you come from a theatrical family, or were you? Do you know what? No, no, no one in my family has anything to do with performance or theatre whatsoever. Um. But uh, my dad was always a bit of a extrovert, <laughs> so I think I got that side um, of things from him. Like we go on holiday, and if there was a hypnotist on, he'd be the first one with his hand in the air saying, "Pick me." <laughs> I remember one year uh, he got hypnotised and he made love with a mop. Oh, uh, yeah. How old were you then, by the way? <laughs> Hasn't scarred you at all? Has it, um... <laughs> I, I, I think I was about six years old at the time. <laughs> oh, goodness, mate. And I remember thinking, I remember t- asking my mum, Mum, what is Dad doing with that mop? <laughs> I'll tell you when you're older, son. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I think I get that side of things from him. And then w- when I was a kid and I, I started going into doing uh, Amdram and stuff, it had always been my dad that took me. And then after a, after a while, he thought, you know what, I'm here, so I might as well get involved. <laughs> so then my dad did start to get involved in productions. Um, and I distinctly remember um, doing a production with a local group called the Barnby Dunn Players, who were still going, they're fabulous. They do their uh, panto in the February half term. And we did Cinderella, and he was the master of ceremonies at the, at the ball you know, bringing everyone into the ballroom. And I was the town crier. And that was our ste- uh, our debut um, performance together. How wonderful. Yeah. And then over the years, he started doing more and more theatre um, and then got a bad knee. So I had to stop. Has that answered your question? Oh, poor thing. Well, yeah, that has, actually. That's, yeah. um, I wasn't expecting that answer about the mop anyway. <laughs> oh, <Not> well. <laughs> Did you go and see productions as a child then? Yeah, always. My mum always took me to see things. Um, like in the summer holidays, the, the, there was like a theatre club in Rotherham at the Rotherham Arts Centre. And every weekend, you paid one one fee for the whole summer. And it included like theatre workshops and uh, puppet making and and three productions that you could go watch and it was just fabulous and I'd go every summer to see that but I'd be taken to see all the pantos all the local pantos um, and then once a year we'd go to London and see a West End show see I saw a lot of theatre growing up yeah what kind of pantomimes were you seeing then? do you remember the first one? the first one I saw um, was Aladdin at Doncaster Civic Theatre which has now been knocked down Sadly, because it was a beautiful old 1920s theatre. Beautiful. Um, and it was Dougie Brown as Widow Twanky. I distinctly remember him. And I remember he wore a purple wig with a washing line on top. And 
Pee Wee Price was wishy washy. Yeah, that's the first panto I saw. Doncaster Civic Theatre. Because there is a very much a, a northern sort of comic feel to this area. Oh god, yeah. Well, you, uh, we've got all the best working men's clubs around here. Big mining community, Doncaster. So there's very much that um, rough kind of uh, salt of the earth type um, sense of humour in the air around here. Did you go to the working men's clubs as well? No, no, I didn't. Um, it, I only later when I started singing, doing doing the club circuit. Um, uh, that was an eye opener. <laughs> it definitely teaches you how to handle an audience and how to handle anything that's thrown at you. Not literally, I hope. Well, sometimes. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I've had beer mats thrown at me. <laughs> I've had all sorts thrown at me over the years. Because I haven't sung what people have wanted me to sing or for one reason or another. I went to a very interesting venue. I won't tell you the name of it. In Mexborough. And um, there was a group of women sat on the table in front of me discussing uh, when their husbands were coming out of prison. Nice. <laughs> and uh, and uh, they wanted me to sing. Can I, can I, I can't swear, can I? Yeah, of course. Can I? Bleep it out. They wanted me to sing Smack Your Bitch Up by The Prodigy. And I was like, no, sorry, I can't. I'm not going to sing that. I can give you a bit of Sweet Caroline if you want. <laughs> and they weren't having it, so they started throwing things at me. Pens and such. Nice. And beer mats. Classic, yeah. So I packed up my gear and I said, right, I'm off. Bye. Going back then to Go on. the... The youth and the drama clubs that you used to go to, and uh-huh. things like that. Yeah. Do you remember your very first sort of treading on the boards? The very first time I trod on the boards, I was playing Oliver in Oliver the Musical. You got the lead role. Yeah, yeah. I played Oliver. And that song, Where Is Love, very out of tune. <laughs> I couldn't sing back then. I was, I, uh, yeah. Wasn't, uh, I loved performing as a kid and I was very enthusiastic about it um, but I, I wasn't a singer back then that came later <laughs> but I loved it I loved I loved Oliver it's still one of my favourite musicals but bagging the lead role how old would you have been? I think I was about I must have been about six or seven yeah, and it was directed by a wonderful local theatre director called Simon Carr, who's still a very, very close friend. We've always been very close. Um, he, he does lots with the youth uh, around here, lots of youth theatre and, and things. And he directed it, and it was a fabulous production. I loved it. They must have seen something in you <laughs> as a six-year-old boy to go. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And, he, you know, he supported me all through my career, really. And he, he was the one that encouraged me to go and try out for drama schools. And he'd, he'd spend time and help me with my audition pieces. And he's always been there as a support. So I'm ever thankful to him. What was that first run like of Oliver? It was... Well, it was only a short run. I think we did about four days. Um, it was at the Harvey Theatre in um, High Melton College in Doncaster. Um, and it's, it's a lovely space because it's, it's almost like a studio space and the audience are really close to you. Um, it was a great run. We had, it was minimal set. We had a very, very small band. It was like a piano and drums. And it was just like, we just had fun. We were just a group of kids having fun doing Oliver, which we'd all seen on TV and stuff, you know, at Christmas and what have you. So, yeah. And do you remember the bows at the end of the applause? I do, yeah. How I that, do. How did that make you feel at that age? At that age? Um, yeah, it was quite emotional. I remember it being quite emotional and feeling as though I'd really achieved something. Um, and I, I guess that's what kind of gave me the, 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 the proper theatre book, you know, made me want to keep going back and doing stuff. I must have been a member of that youth theatre for a good... Ten years before I went off to do more with my career. 
after that then your career as you said uh, went to drama college well i went to sylvia young theater school first age 13 and i'd come but i'd come back weekends and still do the amdram stuff so i was in my life was constantly theater um so i did three years at sylvia young um and then went on to, to italia conti for three years to do um, musical theatre. Yeah. Which was amazing. I loved it there. What I would give to go back and relive those those years of uh, college. What kind so of things? much fun. What kind of things then were you doing? So we do... I was doing ballet, tap, every kind of dance I'd be doing there. We'd have musical theatre classes, acting classes singing classes it was just it was like fame it was like being in fame it was brilliant it was brilliant and it was such i was always brought up to think well not brought up to think but as i was growing up people that had been to drama schools had always said oh they try and alienate you they try and change you and mold you into a into what they want you to be and it, at Conti, that wasn't the case. It was very much a case of you be who you want to be and we'll, we'll uh, work on your talents and make you a strong performer. It was, I loved it. I felt very at home there. Went to a few auditions for drama schools and musical theatre colleges um, and a, a lot of them felt very icy and very... Um, with no disrespect to these schools, they felt... They, they just weren't me. They weren't me, because I was very much of the opinion, you should be yourself. You should always be yourself and not let anyone change you. And Conti allowed me to do that, which was, which was good. So do you remember the first sort of audition that you had after you, leaving? After leaving? After leaving. The first audition I had, I actually got the job. Did you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, it, it was for, it was a... Um, Dance Attic in London and it was for, to be part of an entertainment team for what was then Thompson Gold Hotels um, and I got the job and that was um, in the Algarve uh, uh, not Fuengarola, that's Spain isn't it Albufera Albufera so I did six months in Albufera in a Thompson Gold Hotel and we did uh, Legends of Las Vegas uh, we did Disco Inferno, and we did a show called West End Live. Um, and they were very much like, um, like variety-type shows. There was no kind of plot or, or anything. It was very much sing a song, go off, change a costume. But do you know what? It was great. I really I loved it. And it was great being in the sun for six months. I can imagine. Yeah. And then from that... Um, did three months in Spain, came back for a bit, and then did six months in Turkey, doing the same job. And how old are you now? So I, I left at I left at age eighteen, so I'd have been. Uh, hang on. <laughs> You've done so much at such a young yeah, age. It's... Yeah, yeah. I so by the time I'd finished in Turkey, I was twenty uh, twenty two. Just turned 22. So kind of growing up in your social life really was the acting fraternity. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was all performance. All my friends were performers and probably, and still are performers. All my friends are, I have made through being in one show or another. Have you ever found that difficult though, with, in terms of success that you've had compared to other people and... Success in what way? In, in terms of auditions not getting jobs or one person doing better than the other has there ever been any negativity like that from no others? no never everybody's quite happy never oh god yeah absolutely absolutely everyone's very supportive of each other because i have heard from people that they've said you know that friends sort of fall out because one gets oh no i mean some some of my best friends have, have gone on to do really really um great things you know and it's amazing to see them doing like, if I'll, I'll often see people on the TV that I went to college with and stuff, and it's like, wow, they're achieving so much. 
and they're happy doing what they're doing and I'm equally as happy doing what I'm doing so there's no kind of bitterness or anything like that that's great yeah yeah it's great and we always send each other happy birthday messages and you know we don't we're not in touch as much as we'd like to be because our schedules are very busy but it, we're still very much friends and nothing's really changed during that time then what sort of shows were you actually going to see living in London and... I would see everything so <laughs> I think I saw Priscilla Queen of the Desert uh, once a week uh, <laughs> for for about for about a month yeah. so four times I saw it one week after the other God, I loved that show so I'd have a hard week at college and then I'd be like well I need, I need to cheer myself up what what show is going to cheer me up the most? You know, what is the campus thing in the West End right now? <laughs> and it was that. So I was like, yeah. Yeah. I loved that show so much. I believe it's on tour again now. I think it is. Yeah, brand new production. And what about the classics? Or the, the long runners, shall I say? Not necessarily classics, but... Long running shows. But like Les Mis. Like Les Mis. Oh, I love, I love all that. Love Les Mis and Phantom. I love all those classic shows. And I I loved that revival of um, Miss Saigon, the latest revival that was in the West End, that then went on tour. I don't know what it's doing now, but that was amazing. And uh, what's his name? I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. John 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 John, John, John Brion's was absolutely phenomenal. It's the engineer. Love him. Love him so much. I remember seeing him in Oxford when it did a tour it must must have been 10 years before that revival and he was good then too but he was even better the last time but yeah I love I love all the Lloyd Webber musicals I love all the Rodgers and Hammerstein I love it all <laughs> I love it do you still find yourself taking notes on performers constantly Constantly. I cannot go and see anything without uh, have my inner critic, <laughs> you know. And I try not to be like that. I, 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 I would love to just go and watch something and enjoy it, but I find it impossible mm. to, to do that. You know, I'm constantly making notes and, and thinking, well, how can I apply what that person's doing to maybe make me better as a performer? You know, I'm always stealing little little bits from people, which is what you do that naturally as a performer. I think everyone does that. Any particular examples? Any particular examples? Um, so, for example, I, I see a lot of pantomime. I probably see up to six pantomimes a year. I try and squeeze in that many between what I'm doing. And I, I take inspiration from um, villains like David Leonard and Steve Arnott. I think they're absolutely fabulous. They're brilliant at what they do. Um, so I'm constantly inspired by people like that, that have been in the business for a long time and know what they're doing, know that art well, you know. And their wealth of experience. Mm. Have you ever spoken to them? I've spoken to Steve very briefly. I, I saw him um, a couple of weeks ago. I was doing a launch for Jack and the Beanstalk in Yarm. And he was there for a photo shoot for another project that Tom Rolfe are producing. And we, we got to have a quick chat then. Um, and he's just a lovely man. It's hard to believe that he's he can be so villainous <laughs> on stage. <laughs> what is it about the villain then for you that's... Uh kind of become your thing become my thing yes yeah, your niche I don't know I I, I, th I think I inject a certain campness into the villain <laughs> and some people might tell me I'm, I'm, probably, I'm, I'm maybe a little bit too camp as the villain but it's my style I think the villain should always be a little bit funny I don't think that he should be necessarily scary I think people should hate him but love to hate him you know mm. a bit like the Ugly Sisters you, you want to make the audience hate you 
but love you at the same time. It's a fine line, isn't it? It is a fine line. It is. I mean, I've done Sisters a few times as well. There should be books written yeah. on this, uh, on this particular art form, I do believe. That I, th- I think they should. Trying to perfect the, the villain, the bad. Yeah. I mean, I don't think there is a set way that it should be played. Everyone's going to play it differently. Um, you know, everyone has their style. But that, that is my style. I'm a little bit dick dastardly like <laughs> you know, camp in that kind of way. Mm. A bit Robbie Rotten from Lazy Town. Yes. <laughs> kind of styly. Do you know what I mean? With a hint of Jim Carrey. Mm. A you bit know? of mania and Yeah. Yeah. A dash of mania, a dash of camp, a dash of or a big dollop of camp. Absolutely. And, um, oh god yeah. But also the, the look in the nicest possible way. You have a kind of a Terence Stamp sort of Superman <laughs> look about you at the it's, moment anyway with the beard. With, uh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. It's I mean that didn't that's not a gimmick or anything. That I just decided that I look a bit like a baby without a beard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with the bald head. Yeah, I've not seen you without the beard. No, but I've got a, I've got a baby face. So without the beard, I look about six years old. <laughs> so I have to. That's not a bad thing, though, is it? Really? Mm, so, well, I, I don't you know. You can always age up. I can always age up, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not a fan of myself without the beard. No. <laughs> yeah, and you've got to have hair like. I started losing my hair very early on. So I shaved my hair off, right. And I just looked, I looked strange. So I thought, I'll even it out by growing the beard. Mm. You know. <laughs> the expressions then, when you're Go a baddie. On. Expressions. Yes. Facial your, expressions. Your facial expressions. When you're, <laughs> when you're delivering the lines and you're giving the looks. Mm. Yeah, I'm all eyebrows, I think. Mm. All, it's all in the eyebrows. <laughs> It's all, in, it's all in an eyebrow and a smirk, you know. You know, the old... Not a lot of people can do it, can isolate their eyebrows Yes, like that. and, and you, you've got <laughs> yeah. that little, little school. You can't learn that, can you? It's no. Literally, you're no. born with it or not. I remember seeing The Rock do it. Yes. You know, that thing where he lifts... Uh, I remember thinking, oh, I'll give that a go. So, so I did. And then I've, d- I've done it ever since. Do you have That's it then my... in the in the script when you're getting your script? I yeah, there's a script there on the floor. Do you sort of go eyebrow pa- raise now? Pause for eyebrow raise. <laughs> <laughs> Laugh. <laughs> <There we go. laughs> no, it just comes naturally. It just comes naturally. Yeah. Yeah. Is that during the rehearsal period then, when you're sort of working at where it all all fits in, or or that first performance in front of the audience? No, I'd say in the rehearsal period. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, I like to play with the character a little bit in rehearsals, you know, and with the, with the physicality. Because my, my body is never always exactly the same. So, for example, for Flesh Creep this year, I'm going to try and be a little bit child catcher like with it and a little bit uh, spider like, you know, a bit yes. creepy. So, I'm going to play with my physicality a bit. Um,. I, you know, I'm all fingers, you know, that, yeah. ki- that kind of a thing. Um, kind of unsettling. Yeah, yeah. Unsettling, camp, and a bit menacing. Spider-like and... Yeah, yeah. You don't know what he's going to do or where he's going to go. Or... He, he, he needs to give people that that um, uncertain feeling. Creepy. Uh, yeah, In a nice creepy. Way, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah, in a nice, not in a pervy way or anything. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I was say. no, no, of course not. <laughs> but no, I've, like, but I've played Abenaza in the past. And it still had that hint of camp, but he's also been. Oh, he's one of the campers now. Uh, yeah, but I've, I've played him a bit more bold, a bit more. Butch. Uh, not, I wouldn't say butch. I wouldn't go as far as that. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I've tried to do that before, and it, and it just looked like me trying to be Butch, it, well, which is it's not great. So, yeah, 
but I've tried to be more when I did Abenazo I tried to be a bit more bold and uh, demanding and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to find words here <laughs> to, to describe this have you ever played child catcher? no I'd love to I'd love to play child catcher that was always one of my dream roles growing up I remember seeing it at the Palladium and I saw Derek Griffiths as the child catcher. And he was amazing. He was absolutely brilliant. Um, I thought, yeah, I'd love to play that role. I can't imagine him as child catcher, to be fair. Oh, he was brilliant. Because I saw him as Lumiere in Beauty and the Beauty, Yeah, yeah. At the Dominion. And he was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. He was an amazing child catcher. He was, he was scary. Hmm. He was really scary. And he had a longer nose than what the normal child catchers would have. Because they all had prosthetic noses mm. through that run at the Palladium. But his seemed to be <laughs> slightly longer, <laughs> which made him more menacing than the others. But yeah, him playing that role inspired me a lot. It's my villain. When, when I think about it. What about the actual film version with Robert Helpman? Oh, well, he's fabulous, isn't he? Trained ballet dancer. He's great. Just... He's great. Yeah, yeah. He scared me as a kid. I think. He's, I think he scared everyone as a kid. He I think did. He was in everyone's nightmares. And unsettling as well. Even now to watch it, you just think them eyes, the nose. Oh the, God. The look, it, perfect, but amazing. And I, I remember seeing a recording of him as um, an ugly sister, in in the ballet version of Cinderella. And he was amazing in that too. I'm gonna to have to look that up. Yeah. Listeners, look that up. It's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. From years ago, I think it was in the eighties or seventies. And apparently, one of the sweetest men going as well. Yeah, I heard. I heard that too. Yeah. Prove the point that baddies are some of the nicest people. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. What's it like then? Once sort of the last show's over on an evening, what what do you find yourself socialising with the cast much? Oh God, yeah, yeah, all the time. Like we love a we love a party when we're doing panto and the camaraderie as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, one year we um, <laughs> one year we had a sleepover at the theatre. We the cast had a sleepover oh, at the theatre. Yeah, funny. they let they let us do that. This is at the Dome Playhouse, uh, which I've been uh, directing and in the pantos for the last uh, probably five or six years. <laughs> Uh, this was the first year that I was there, 2000 and... I can't remember. Uh, but um, he was, we were doing Aladdin. And, yeah, we had this sleepover. And we all had quite a bit to drink. And we were playing hide-and-seek in the theatre. Oh. It was fabulous, with no lights on. And we're talking a theatre that's probably 100 years old. It's, <laughs> it's got to have some ghosts. <laughs> you they know. all have, like, yeah. when they're built, they get the ghosts, don't they? That's... Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, that was great. And we were, um, were in the auditorium, and the seats in the balcony were folding up and down on their own. And, uh, yeah, freaked us out a bit. Did you scream? Did I scream? Of course I screamed. <laughs> <laughs> and we, and we've had ghost hunters in since then. Have you? Oh, yeah, and they've, 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 they've picked things up. Yeah, it's great. It adds to the mystique. And oh, of course it does. Though, oh, it? of course it does. I mean, the theatre used to be um, a miners' community welfare hall, which I think 16 years ago they renovated it into a theatre. And um, there's pictures all up on the walls of all the pantos that the miners did through the years. And there's some fabulous, fabulous pictures, old pictures. And um, apparently, this is just a story that I've heard, but one of the ghosts is a dame. One of the ghosts is an old dame that come, that rises up through the trapdoor and then vanishes. You have an old-fashioned trapdoor. There's an old-fashioned trapdoor. Do you make your entrances on that? I did once. Um, it hadn't been used in about, it, well, in years, probably in about 30, 40 years. It, never, it hadn't been used. And I went down, because you have to get in a trapdoor in the wings to then go through this tunnel under the stage, which you, are, you, you, you have to go on all fours. You have to crawl through a tunnel. 
<laughs> Under oh. the stage. This is a proper old-fashioned theatre. So you're crawling through this tunnel on your hands and knees. It's uh, Health and safety probably would have had an issue with this. And then you literally lift up the flap, lift up the, the lid <laughs> and come through. And so I made my entrance as King Rat coming out of the sewer. It's, it's the opening of Act One. Very first moment of the show. I'm coming out of the sewer as King Rat. The amount of dust that came out of that trapdoor with me set off the fire alarms. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to stop the show and start again. Could you do me a favour, please? Could yeah. Get a video of that. I've got it. I've got. Yeah, a, I've, you... yeah I've got a video of it. Oh, because I'll post. A link, if that's... Oh, do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you can YouTube it, and then I'll post a link. Yeah, I can do that. Because I'm sure a lot of our listeners would love to... I can do that. ...see the oh. Dern Playhouse as well. Do, they oh, do that... tours of the place? Um, no, they don't do tours. They don't do tours. They should do. They should do tours. Because it's a lovely, lovely old building, lovely old theatre. What started then your association with Dern Playhouse? Well, I always did shows there as a kid, with Simon Carr who I mentioned earlier, um, we did loads of stuff, loads of musicals and things there. Um, and then I did my, I went and off, off and did my training. And then the first year that they started doing professional pantomimes, um, I got a phone call saying, would you like to come and be Abanaza? I was like, yeah, I'd love to. Not even an audition or? No. No, no, they just seen me doing stuff over the years. I was like, I would absolutely love to. It's an honor, eh? Yeah, and it was great, and I had such fun. I've been going back ever since. And the audiences are great there too. It's a, it's a, a proper community audience. How many does it hold? Uh, yeah, about three seventy, I think. Three seventy. Um, what yeah. sort of capacity are you playing to each night? Full houses. Full houses. Yeah, brilliant. full houses. It's great. But they love it. It's it, They book their tickets early every year. Um, and you see the same faces every year. And you see kids growing up. And it's it's lovely. But that's making you feel old as well. Well, it does, yeah. <laughs> it does. It does. But I, I love it there. And the directing. When did they ask you to direct? Well, that's... I, I actually offered to do that, um, I literally just said I would love to give it a go. Because I was all, while I was being directed, I'd always come up with ideas and kind of say, oh, can I try this, can, you know, which I think most actors do. Mm. Um, and I'd, I'd constantly be thinking, oh, this would be a really fun and different way to do this scene, to play this scene. And so I'd always be suggesting things to the director. And then one year I thought, you know what, I'd, I'd really live to give this, I'd love to give this a go. And they were like, well, yeah, we, we'd love for you to do that. And so my first one was Cinderella. And I directed it and played one of the uglies as well. That was a lot of fun. I loved it. Did it organically develop over the run or was it pretty much ready from day one? What, do you mean the direction? The direction. I spent a lot of time before I actually started rehearsals planning out what I was going to do. I mean, <sighs> pantos can go anywhere, you know. You, as a director, you might have it planned out, but it's very rarely does it go how you, how you have it planned. Because like I did, the actors will have suggestions about how they want to play their character. And you can't, you can't say no. I very want... open then. Oh god yeah, absolutely yeah. You you can't say no. There's you cannot play it that way. Because they have some fantastic ideas. I work with a guy called Danny Glover, who he he's our comic now. He's been our comic at the Playhouse for the last two or three years now. And he's brilliant. He's just fantastic. And some of his ideas are just out of this world. And he's great. And people now book to see him. They'll, they'll, they'll inquire, they'll say, is, is Danny Glover in the panto this year? And I'll say, yeah. And they'll, they'll book on the premise that he's in it. Do you tell him that? Absolutely. He's, <laughs> got, the, he's got the biggest head. <laughs> He'll be listening to this. Okay. Yeah. 
And so who are you getting for comic next year then? Um. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> so I said, I said to him, are you, are you going to be coming back next year? And he says, as long as my wife will let me do it, <laughs> I will come back. Best way to be, yeah. Yeah. Get clearance. Yeah. <laughs> His wife's very understanding. She lets him, she lets him do a lot. She's lovely. Have there been challenges as a, as a director? Challenges? Yeah. I've worked with a few divas. Oh. I won't name names. No. No. But I've worked, I've worked with some divas. <laughs> and how do you get round that? I like the kill with kindness method. Please elaborate. <laughs> so, yeah... <laughs> You know, if if you seem to not let anything phase you and, you, and you and you approach everything with it with a big smile, as though nothing's bothering you, and you just say no, this is how it's going to go. It, that tends to work. What kind of things have you had to kind of endure or put up with? For example, people. Uh, <laughs> wanting to do their own thing to the extent that it's going to take away from someone else in a scene. Mm. You know, someone thinking that it's their show, you know, rather than... Because I like, I, I like our shows to be ensemble pieces. No one is bigger. It's a team effort, yeah. Yeah, it is a team effort, totally, totally. Um... And and we like everyone to have an equal role, you know. No, each character has a solo. No character has more solos than another. It's singing wise, you know. So, and and we like to work with nice people. So, the people that do come and cause trouble don't tend to come back. <laughs> and I think at the moment we've got a nice team, a nice a nice team of people that we can rely upon. It's good. Can it sour the pantomime feel? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, it can. If you've got someone that's going to... Be toxic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It can. Don't know yeah. how they do it. No, no, it's just... I don't know. I don't know. But no, it's... When you've got a good team of people working with you and it's a great vibe, I think it adds so much to the performance, doesn't it? You get you, as an audience. Oh, of course you can. If you're having fun as a cast on stage, then the audience are definitely having fun with you. As a big fan then of pantomime, mm. have you ever been in an audience and watched a, a production and actually not enjoyed it? There's been a few. I've walked out of a few. Yeah, yeah, in the interval. Which and I hate doing that. You know, I hate walking out of of, of stuff because I'd hate it if someone did it to me. Um, but there's been a few that I've just thought, do you know what? I can't, I can't sit through this any longer. What was wrong with them? It was just lacklustre. And it was, it, it was a, a school performance as well. And you could, you could tell that the cast were, were phoning it in. It was... They didn't want to. You could tell the cast did not want to be there. The jokes weren't deli- weren't being delivered right. Um, there were no gaps for, for for laughter, and I think because the kids weren't understanding a lot of the jokes, I think some of the jokes were a bit too mature for the kids. There was no laughter, which I think then was making the actors feel um, as though they weren't doing the job right, which was showing on on stage. Did you feel like you wanted to get up there and say, stop Oh, this. God, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it felt very awkward. It, it, you know one of those moments where you have to put your head in your hands <sighs> because it's, mm. it, it's like a moment... Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a moment of silence where there should be laughter and, th- and there's nothing. <laughs> what about pro pantos, then? Have you ever seen any which you just think, no, it's all wrong, or... <sighs> or you've been really bitterly disappointed by... Without the, naming productions. Without naming productions, yes. Yes. There has been one. It was an actor muso panto, mm. which I think are quite strange anyway. I mean, I love that that people are being creative and thinking, yeah, let's do panto in a new, uh, fresh way, because um, panto is evolving all the time, you know, 
And I think that's great. Um, but for the princess to be kidnapped by the giant and taken away by the giant and then have her appear on the other side of the stage playing a ukulele and have the comics say, boys and girls, where's the princess? Has the princess been taken by the giant? And the kids are going, no, she's there. She's there holding a ukulele. <laughs> it uh, takes away from the, the storyline and the magic, doesn't it? Mm. And I just think that that's all, that's all wrong. That's wrong. So, and, but I totally understood where they were going with it. And like, for example, they had, there, there was a keyboard at the front of the stage. And you could, uh, so all, all the rest of the set was dressed up as, uh, um, you know, Arabian Nights. It, it was Aladdin, but the, the Arabian Nights version, which I thought was a, ma- a great idea, because not many people do that now. Um, so that, the stage was all dressed up. And then there was this keyboard at the front, which clearly said Yamaha across the front of it. And I just thought, well, they could have dressed it with something. Mm. Do you know what I mean? To make it match the set. Yes. So things like that annoy me. And that was a professional production. And that annoyed me. I stayed through it, though. I didn't walk out of that one. (laughs) (laughs) What for you, then, is the most important part of the pantomime? Is it the script? Is it the story? Is it the characterisation? I think panto should have a very strong story. I think it should be very clear. Um, A strong story, but with the right amount of gags. I don't think a panto should be taken over by gags, if that makes mm. sense. Um, at one time, it was getting that way. Not, it's not so much now. A lot are pulling back on them. Um, but I think a st- you can't go wrong with a strong st- storyline that everyone knows. And uh, I think the the heart of the characters should come through. You know, you know the, the pathos side of things. Have you ever wanted to play, like, the buttons or the... Oh, I've played buttons you before. You have played buttons. Yeah, I've played buttons before. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. Great role. I've played it both in a normal pantomime and an adult pantomime. It was great. <laughs> the adult panto. Yeah. Because you've, yeah. you've been involved with a, a few of those as well over the yeah. years, haven't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's what's the big difference apart from the glaring obvious that there's a a bit more? Well, I don't think there is a massive difference. Just that you can get away with a lot more. So all, it's basically all the things that you want to say in a normal banto, but you can just say it. You know, I've often wanted to swear when I've been doing normal pantos. <laughs> and when you just when you're about to do an ad lib. Mm. And you almost swear, but it, you, you stop yourself. Well, with an adult panto, you can just go for it. It's great. <laughs> so you find yourself going off the book quite a bit? Oh, totally. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very rare that we that the script that we get given is the script that we perform. <laughs> with both the normal and, and adult pantos. Do you love that sense of freedom that pantomime gives you? Totally, yeah. I think it's great. It's great. The fact that you can talk to the audience and actually com- have a conversation with the audience is amazing. I love that. I love that Panto is this world of... It's very clear that you're in Doncaster or Sheffield or Rotherham or wherever you are, mm. but you're also in this magical land of Peking or... Trumpy Town or wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs> That's where we are in Jack and the Beanstalk this year. Trumpy Town. Trumpy Town. Yeah. Who's, I who's the villain? Can I, can I guess? Who could be the the big baddie? Oh, no, it's, it's Flesh Creep. Oh, it is it's, it's Flesh Creep. creep. But the ta- in the script, the town is named as Trumpy Town. Yeah. Yeah. I read through the script for the first time the other day. I thought, oh, I like that. I like that as a name of a panto town. It's quite relevant, isn't it? You've got to keep it relevant. Yeah, of course you have. Yeah. So I've no doubt there'll be a few Trump jokes. Well, there'll definitely be Trump jokes. I'm sure. 
That's if he's still going to be the big boss. Well, we'll see. Yeah. Fingers well, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's, let's not get political. Let's not get political. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you've had the script delivered, then. What do you find yourself making notes all the, through it, or add? Not thinking? yet. Okay. Not yet. No, I like I like to get to rehearsals before I do any of that. Um, I mean, I met the cast for the first time a couple of weeks ago, and I everyone's so lovely. I think we're going to have a great time. It's a really talented cast, and of course, Tom Rolfe is has written it and is directing it and is in it so it's going to be a lot of fun when it comes to christmas then yeah you're traveling all over the place yeah sometimes yeah now you've got down playhouse which is quite close to home yeah yeah do you miss home uh, during that time the christmas with the family i i don't i really I, I don't at all um, I, I've been so used to being away, you know, work, working away that it, it it doesn't bother me. I mean, I love Christmas time, and I I do always get back for Christmas Day. Um, but yeah, it it, it, it I think when it, it, when I was younger, it would have bothered me more, but now it's Christmas isn't such a big deal to me. I'm not. I'm not so precious about coming home for Christmas. Did the family come and see you perform? Oh, yeah, yeah. They'll be coming Christmas Eve to see me this year. And then we'll all come back together for Christmas Day. And then I'm back on it on Boxing Day. Do you find it tiring (laughs) during the run? I do, but that good kind of tiring. You know, the tiring where it's like, yeah, give me two minutes and then I'll be ready again to, Mm. to keep going. That kind of tiring. I love it. You know, it's when you, when you love something, you don't really tire of it that much. I think I think most panto performers will say the same thing. You don't find it sort of three quarters of the way through a bit of a chore. You, um, you sometimes hear that. Yeah, I, I I wouldn't call it a chore. I'd say I'd say that it it does get very draining, and you often feel when you get off stage that you have to actually lie down until your next entrance <laughs> just to kind of recharge the batteries a little bit but I never get to the stage where I feel like I've had enough you know like I'm doing it because I have to do it you know I I get to the end of a run and I feel like I can do another another couple of weeks It's it's never quite enough for me What's your routine then for keeping yourself well during the run? Because so there's coughs and colds in winter times. <clears throat> yeah, I, I I live on a diet of fruit and veg, basically. I live on a diet of fruit and veg and alcohol. Yeah, I know. Well, you have to you have to unwind after rehearsals. I think that's important to unwind. Not every night, you know. Mentally keeping but, yourself, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just you know you have to chill out after rehearsals and and such. Um, and I I tend to eat lot. I can't eat full meals before I on a show day. I have to like I live on grapes. I'll just eat grapes, and then I'm I'm, I'm and I'm fine on that. I don't, if I ate a full meal, I would just feel sick. I think, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I lots of water, lots of steaming. I like to I steam for an hour before I go on stage, do my vocal warm up, stretch my limbs out a bit. Yeah, you've got quite a good <laughs> health, reasonably healthy Christmas Christmas routine there. Yeah, I mean, obviously on Christmas Day I binge a bit. Mm. <laughs> you've got to. Yeah. The yeah. So Boxing Day is always a bit of a, a bit hard work. How do you find the Boxing Day audiences? Boxing Day audiences are can be strange because everyone's knackered, aren't they? Am I allowed to say that word? Yeah, you can say any knackered. word you want. <laughs> <laughs> with, with past form of some people. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, everyone's knackered on Boxing Day, aren't they? So they just want to sit and enjoy <laughs> and just... <laughs> 
Do you know what I mean? They don't want to have to put effort into watching anything. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, still a nice audience, but not as not as enthusiastic as maybe mm. a, a Christmas Eve audience mm. who are excited about Christmas Day, <laughs> and, and they're just like, "Yeah, why not? Let's go for it." Do you like the matinees with the schools in? I do. I actually do. We have a, at the Dern Playhouse. We have a lovely lady called Joyce. That's all right. We have a lovely lady called Joyce, and she um, she goes out into the she she sells ice creams, and she goes out into the audience, and she gets everyone like singing. She gets all the kids singing. She says, "Right, you know what to do when the baddie comes on, don't you?" And she goes, and she, you know, she lets them all know what they have to do. She loves it, bless her. She's been, she's worked at the theatre for years and years. She's like a piece of part of the furniture. And there's another lady called Pauline, and they both go out and they and they do their bit to to get the kids revved up. Um, and oh, and she finds a male teacher for the dame to pick on. And she'll come backstage and she'll say, there's, there's this male teacher sat on such and such a row. His name's whatever. So the, so the dame already knows who he's picking on. That's great. Yeah, yeah. So we have like a... We have a scout <laughs> <laughs> to, to find the victim. Did you go and see any productions when you were a child with the school? We always went to Sheffield Lyceum to see their panto. And the one that sticks out for me is the Chuckle Brothers, Dick Whittington. Yeah, it was Dick Whittington. Chuckle Brothers, as Captain and Mate, uh, Rory the Tiger was in it, as you know, the Haven mm. mascot. Um, That's a like, bit of advertising, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Those days have gone a bit, haven't they? Rory the Tiger? Yeah, yeah. Kind of... the Tiger Club. Yeah, like shoehorning in, <laughs> you know, the latest postman Pat or yeah, they've, 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 um, those days have gone. The Fireman Sam. It was Fifi the flower pot. Uh, what was it? What was her name? Yeah, Fifi yeah, the, the flower pot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She did it for a while. She, I think, she did three consecutive years at Doncaster <laughs> with the voice of Jane Horrocks, of course. Yeah, I, rem- I remember this one. I see Chocolate Brothers, Rory the Tiger, uh, Robin Asquith was King Rat and he was phenomenal he's another one that inspired me um, I, his first entrance was from one of the boxers and he, he climbed down from the boxers onto the stage I just thought that is brilliant that is really good and he had a whip I remember he had a whip and he was he was so scary he wasn't a camp villain he played it fully I don't think Robin Asquith could ever be accused of camp, ever. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> but he had... Uh, <laughs> he, was, he, he, was in, he was in tight leather, I remember that. Mm. And he had, like, a big... It looked a bit like Alice Cooper. That's the look that I think he was going for. And he had this whip. And he was, he was really scary. Who else was in it? Tony Piers was Sarah the Cook. He was brilliant. He's now he's a proper traditional dame, isn't he? He was wonderful. Who else was in that? It was the fairy. Was the lady from Last of the Summer Wine with the bleach blonde hair? Oh, I, always I, getting I, off I, with I, Howard. Yeah, Marina. I can't Marina. Remember her. She she was the fairy. That was a fabulous panto. That's one that stood out for me. And another one. It was another. At the Lyceum, and the ugly it was the ugly sisters were Nigel Ellicott and um, Andrew Ryan, I believe, working together, which I think they've only done once in in that panto. Or it might not have been Nigel Ellicott up with someone else. I don't know if it was Nigel or not. I could be Nigel will probably be able to tell you. Mm. I'm sure, but um, yeah, that was fabulous. Yeah, I love Andrew Ryan as a dame. I think he's amazing. He's one of my favourite dames. All these people that you mentioned have had such an influence on you. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Was it just inevitable that you would have gone into pantomime anyway, just 
ever since you were a child thinking about? I've always gone out of my way to make sure that I'm doing a panto at Christmas. I can't remember a Christmas from the age of being 10 of not doing a panto, whether it's been amateur or professional, every year. <laughs> my first professional pantomime was at the age of 10. I did Babes in the Wood at the Doncaster Civic Theatre for um, David Lee of Pantone Pantomimes. Um, and there was a fabulous dame in that called George Kelly. And you, you don't hear anything, anything from him now. But he was wonderful. Uh, and he was, only, he was only a young dame. But when he was on stage, he could have passed as a 60-year-old woman. He was brilliant. Really Welsh, you know, really, really Welsh. Um, and he had a massive influence on me. I just thought everything that he did in that panto was amazing. And I'd sit there as a 10-year-old and watch him and just think, you're, br you're brilliant. And like, I'd watch him do his makeup before a show. And just, every show, every performance. He must have got fed up of me being in his dressing room. Mm, crazy. You wouldn't be able to do that. Though. You wouldn't be able to do that. Obviously I wasn't in there while he was getting changed or anything. I'd, I'd go in 10 minutes before the show was mm. about to go up. I remember he made his first entrance in a in a, a wicker bath. Postman Pat brought on the it's the delivery for Maid Marian, and uh, uh, Postman Pat dragged on this wicker basket, and George Kelly was inside it. And uh, his first entrance was at, coming out of this wicker basket. I remember that. I like interesting entrances. I remember. I'm going off on a tangent now. I remember seeing Jack and the Beanstalk at the Lyceum Theatre and Andrew Ryan was the dame in that and he made his first entrance dressed as Mary Poppins um, and they flew him down and he, he came down on some... he had helium balloons as they was floating down from the sky with helium balloons. What's been your favourite entrance? Oh, it's through the trapdoor, setting off the fire alarms. <laughs> Anything you'd like to do? Oh, I'd like to be flown. I'd like to fly in. I'd like to do a fly... I've never flown. I've never flown. I'd love to do that. Looks a bit frightening, if I'm honest. I'm I mean, I don't, li I don't like heights. I don't like heights, but I'd love to say I've done it. You know. I don't know what character I could play to be flown, though. It's not often that a baddie's flown. I could do it as a dame, I guess. Have you played Dan yet? Yeah, I've done it a couple of times. Yeah. You said you've done Ugly Sister. I've done Ugly Sister. I did Nurse Penicillin <laughs> in Sleeping Beauty. How was Dan for you? I loved it. Loved it. How did you play it? Um, different to how I played my sister. When I played my sister, I was I did it almost in a not a draggy way, but I wasn't motherly or, or cuddly. I was very I'd say the way I describe it is spiky. I was quite spiky. Mm. Um, I'm a bit uh, quite aggressive as an ugly sister. But when I played Dame, I think I was a bit more. I'd say I was motherly, uh, quite well spoken. Quite Mary Poppins esque, I'd say. Um, yeah. No, oh, I love. I love. Uh, for, for a long time, that's all I wanted to do, is play Dame. And then I found that I could have just as much fun being a villain. Not as many costume changes. Not, uh, not as many costume changes. But I love that about being a Dame. I love the fact that. You know, you don't really have time to go into your dressing room. All your costumes are lined up in the wings. You just. <laughs> Is there anything that you plan to one you haven't done yet that you want to do? Because <sighs> we've had you as. We've, I've done but comic. I've done comic. comic. I've done. Yeah, I've done dame. Done villain. Um, done babe. I've done a babe. <laughs> I've done a babe. Do you know what? I don't think there is. I think I've. I think I've pretty much. I don't think I could do a principal boy. I think I'm too... 
too much of a character actor to pull that off. I don't think I'm handsome enough for one. No, I don't think I could do that. So what? I'm happy with the, I'm happy with the cast, the, the, the characters I played. What about writing? I've yeah, I've written too. I've written too. Yeah. I wrote Goldilocks that we just did as a summer panther at the Dern Playhouse. <laughs> And last Christmas I wrote The Snow Queen for the Dome Playhouse. Two very different, not really traditional... I know Goldilocks is a tradition. Actually. Yeah, like, yeah. well, it's, 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 it's becoming more popular now, more isn't popular, it? yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, The Snow Queen was hard to write. It was really hard to write. You know. But that gave... Because it's not a well-known story, really, um, it gave me a lot of freedom to create parts that weren't originally there you know so for example I added in a the comic was a talking snowman that came to life and uh, instead of the, the the grandmother it was a a, a mad auntie auntie Polly <laughs> Obviously, the Snow Queen was the, the villain. Mm. What else did we have? We had some trolls. The Spirit of Christmas was the fairy. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. We had a lot of good comments about it. Saying, you know, people saying that it's ref a bit refreshing to see mm. something different. Do you read the reviews? I don't like to. I don't like to. Some I do. You know, because I do like I do like a bit of constructive criticism. And I think without without any kind of criticism, how are you supposed to how are you supposed to improve? How are you supposed to get better? People don't tell you what's wrong. And have so, you yeah. ever had negativity? I wouldn't say negativity. No, it's just little things like people say, oh, saying well, there's too many songs. You know, or the songs went on for too long, maybe you have to cut them down to a minute rather than two minutes. Mm. Just things like that, you know. But nothing but, ever... No, nothing, nothing ever. Then you've been very, very lucky. Yeah. <laughs> or extremely talented in, yeah, in the way it's... <laughs> yeah, I've never... I've never heard anyone say anything negative. I think because our pantos are so out in the sticks as well, we don't really get... Reviewers as such, mm. we just get people posting things independently on social media and and things. And everyone seems to enjoy themselves. So, yeah, I think we've done well. We've done all right. That's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you find then the attention span of children, trying to keep <sighs> them involved? Because there's so many distractions now in, in real life. There is, yeah. Uh, and to try and keep them entertained for yeah. a time that they're normally not sitting down for that long without some form of electronics in front of them. Yeah. It's hard work, isn't it, sometimes, to do that. I, I once <laughs> I once had to take an iPad out of a child's hand. This child was sat on the front row on his iPad during a show. His parents were happy with him being on the iPad. <laughs> How rude. <laughs> I, I went down the steps and took the iPad off him. Gave it him back at the end. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you were popular. <laughs> were you a baddie then? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I, I was an actual baddie <laughs> on that day. But, yeah, I mean, it's... I think if you're doing your job right, then a kid isn't, isn't going to feel like they need to be on their phones or, you know, want to be elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I think if you're keeping them engaged, you're onto a winner. But then you just get kids that just don't want to be there. Because not, not every kid is want to is going to want to sit in a theatre for two hours. Do you try and win them over if you notice they're sort of distracted to begin with and think I'm going to get you to, to actually yeah. join? Yeah, yeah, and that normally works, if, especially if you're a baddie. If you start throwing threats. <laughs> <laughs> you know, innocent. Oh, you're a sinister man, really, aren't you? <laughs> in, 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 innocent threats like, I'll turn you into a frog, or, you know, mm. stuff like that. Mm. Then I think that you, you get them on your side then. 
especially when they start shouting stuff back at you. It's like, I love that. I love that. When you kind of have a, have a little mini argument with a kid in the audience. It's great. Song sheets. Have you ever done them as comics? Yeah, I've done a song sheet. Not a massive fan, but I've done them. No. <laughs> Not a massive fan. What is it about them? Um, I, I, I just... I don't know. I th- I think they can be tedious at times. I like the exchange that you have with the kids that you bring up. I think that's great. I like the fact that you can talk to them and, you know, anything can happen, can't it? Mm. I love that. I, lo- I love the aspect of this kid could, could say absolutely anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to deal with it. But it, 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 it can go on for too long. And often I've been doing one. And the director's been in the wings going, you know, like, let's get on with it. Tapping the watch. So, yeah. I don't I don't like having to be rushed to get it done. I'd rather, I'd rather give that job to someone else. Since I've been directing, I've never done a song sheet. <laughs> I've never had to. I've been, been a villain, so... <laughs> I think they should occasionally get the villain to do song sheets. Or yeah. Or in halfway through, just, as a, just to mix it up a bit. Yeah. I mean, I've done the... Um, the past couple of years, instead of a song sheet, we've done a, we've done a routine, whether it's been 12 Days of Christmas or if I were not up on this stage. Mm. And I've always been involved in that. You know, the villain's been made good, you know... Mm. The fairies turned him into a nice person or whatever. And so that then allows him to come and be involved in mm. in, in in that routine. And I've loved doing that. The choreography for that. Oh, it's great. Coming from a dancing background as well, you must find that quite quite a challenge, but still quite well, easy. Well, I, I didn't actually choreograph it the last time we did it. We Danny, who's our fool, he, he, he did it. That was his task. What were you hit with, or...? <laughs> I, w- I wasn't. So we did it in a way so that Danny got all the... He got all the... He, got, he was the one getting all the hits. So it, it kind of worked its way inward. So we tried to be slightly different with it. Um, and he just, he just went for it. He threw himself off the stage at one point. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's good at that. He's always falling over. He always complains that because uh, I I I direct slaps, and and he always tells me off for uh, uh, having him get getting slapped too much. <laughs> what makes you laugh then? What makes me laugh? Mm. Oh my god! That's a hard question. So much makes me laugh. It, it, oh God, I like I like dry dry humor, sarcastic humor. You know, um, I love slap, slapstick comedy. I've always loved slapstick comedy. I love Laurel and Hardy and things like that, and the two Ronnies. Yeah, I, a lot. It's hard to say what makes me laugh. I'm always laughing. And you bring that to the pantomime. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. What? I mean, I don't, pantos make me laugh. Panto comedy makes me laugh to this day. I mean, I know what the joke's going to be, but it st- still makes me laugh, even when I know the punchline. It's what, great. What's your favourite routine then to do in a pantomime? I love the Busy Bee gag, you know, with the spit, you know, spitting the water out and all that. Mm. And that was in that production of Babes of the Wood that I did. That was the first time I'd ever seen it. And I've always, since then, I've, I've always loved it. And um, Neil Wheatley was in that production that does, where does he do now? Is it Red Hill? But yeah, he, he, was, he was the comic in that. And um, him and, and the, the guy that he did it with were absolutely fantastic. And he, um, at one point, he came on with a mop 
Like it was mopping up the water, ready for the next scene. <laughs> but they added it into the routine. Mm. And at one point, the, the end of the mop came off, which was script that was supposed to happen. And then when he did that, he acted as though it wasn't supposed to happen and he banged the, the, uh, the handle of the, of the mop on the stage and it snapped in two. Now, that wasn't meant to happen. <laughs> that wasn't meant to happen. And he went into hysterics of laughter and that just... I just thought, yeah, that's panto. Yes, there was some bits that were meant to happen for the comedy, but when things go actually wrong, you can just roll with it completely which is what he did and it was brilliant it was the biggest laugh of the show <laughs> as director do you ever like to try and sort of prank any of your cast on the last run oh my thing? god oh yes what do you yeah do? we've done that a few times so we had the um, the Baron in Jack and the Beanstalk came on with his big book of you know his tax collecting book mm. And uh, we we put we we put some naughty pictures <laughs> from from naughty magazines <laughs> in the book. <laughs> so when he opened it, he got a surprise. <laughs> Great. That's the thing about Panto, though, isn't it? Yeah. It's as much fun for you as it oh, is yeah. for the audience, if not more. Yeah. Oh, and we had so, you know the magic beans. So you know you could get those jelly beans that taste of like it was like a game. And some tasted of, of, like, fruit, but others tasted of, like, vomit. And mm. they had, like, horrible flavours. Do you remember those? Yes. <laughs> you didn't, did you? <laughs> and, yeah, we put, we put the horrible flavours in the, in the bag of beans. And at one point, um, Silly Billy was supposed to swallow the beans. And, and we gave him the, the disgusting vomit-flavoured ones. Cruel. Cool. I know. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> and you're the boss. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> Anything you don't like about pantomime? Do you get the blues? I totally get the blues. When, when it ends, I get the blues. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I wouldn't say there's nothing that I don't like about panto. The one thing that I tend not to like, which I see happening a lot at the moment, sadly, is, is a lot, is politics. And back, uh, you know, um, and bitchiness between companies, and you know, uh, if one company takes over the venue of of a uh, that another company used to have, and but that and then that company's got another venue in another theatre in the same town, and that company saying don't go to see that one because we're the best, I don't like that. I think it, just let people go and see whatever panther they want to go and see. Don't. Don't, as a producer, ever try and brainwash people. Do you know what I mean? Mm, I, I've seen that. Have you seen that? I have seen that. I, I don't... I think that's so unprofessional. Make fun of another town. Make, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. But don't say... But I mean, if there's two pantos in the same town, don't say, come see ours, we're the best. And be open, open about saying, we are... The best, the others is not very good. I think that's terrible. I like the line of if you've enjoyed it, you've been watching this. If you have, yeah, but that's funny. That's funny. That's, that's different. Like tongue in cheek. That's exactly. Mm. That is different. But I'm, I'm talking about on social media. Mm. I, I, I think it's very unprofessional, and I've seen a lot of it just recently. Don't like it. Has social media helped or hindered? I think it's helped in a lot of ways for advertising and things. Mm. You know, being able to post videos and. Stuff like that, I think it's great. And being able to do um, panto diaries and things and posting, you know, uh, daily or weekly updates. I'm doing one this year for Jack and the Beanstalk, which I'm looking forward to. So, yeah, no, I think it's helped. I think it's great. Do you find yourself on social media checking out other performers and performances and what's going on? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I, I follow all the pantomime pages, which I think are great, by the way. Only, I think the fact they've only just arrived oh, really th- in the past year. I think they are amazing. I, I, it's so, um, let's celebrate pantomime. It's such a lovely community. I think it, uh, it's lovely. It's really good. Paul Tate has done really well with that. It's encapsulated a, 
of an, an industry that mm. was so and I, I lo- un, 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 underrepresented as well. Yeah, and I love how everyone helps each other out. Like someone might say, I'm looking for a sketch or, or a skit to put, mm. to put here. Can anyone give me any pointers? And nine times out of ten, there'll be someone in the industry that will say, yeah, I'll, I'll write something for you. And I just think, oh, that's brilliant. That's fabulous. It's quite a, a lovely community, as we said earlier on. There's mm. the occasional bit of toxicity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 99% of the time, everybody Everyone's is lovely. wonderful. Yeah. What's next for you, then, in terms of your goals? My goals? Have you got sort of uh, a bucket list of things you still want to do? <sighs> I, would, I would love to... Well, there's two companies that I'd love to work for. That, that I really love, that I've always wanted to work for from being very young. And then they are Evolution and Kudos. Oh. I just think once, once you work, you've worked for them as a panto performer, you've, you've kind of almost made it in the world of panto, haven't you? So, yeah, I'd, lo- I'd, I'd love to do that. I'd love to do a, a big, proper panto in a big, proper theatre. <laughs> You know, whether it's as a dame or a villain or whatever, anything. And outside of Panto, is there anything you'd like to do? Um, yeah, I w- I'd love to do a run of anything in the West End or a UK tour of a musical. Cause that's what I trained to do. I trained in musical theatre. So I've just never been lucky enough to get a break in anything big. Uh, so... Yeah, I'd love to do that. I'd love to do a cruise. I'd love to do a season as a vocalist or a dancer on a cruise. That would be fabulous. Get to see the world. If there was a choice then between going on tour Mm -hmm. with a musical or being in a big panto, (gasps) what would you do? It would depend what the tour was. To be honest, it, honestly, oh, that's a hard question. Because the money aspect wouldn't matter to me. So, I think I'd probably go with the panto, you know. And I know that might sound daft, but yeah, the panto, hundred percent. Yeah, you yeah. never know. You never know. You never know. You never know. That's the thing with this industry, it's... It's great, and yeah. It's, and, and it's very, it's small, it's a very small industry. Everyone seems to know each other. And, um... And I, I like that about it. It's good. And everyone's so lovely. Everyone is really, really lovely. What's the best advice you've been given over the years? Um, don't be a diva. <laughs> Seriously. No, nobody likes to work with a diva. You know, and some of the most talented people I've ever met have gone into jobs, big professional jobs, acted like a diva, and never worked again. So, yeah, I think, I think that's a good piece of advice. Be nice to everyone. Be a nice person. At what age then were you when you found out that you had a good singing voice? Um, I was, I'd say it, it was in my fir- within my first year at Sylvia Young's. They, the technique that they taught me there really brought something out in my voice that I never knew I had. Um, and from that, I just loved singing. I, I tried out different styles and just absolutely adored it. The you said about when you did Oliver, when yeah, you were a child. The, yeah, I was the, completely out of tune. <laughs> I mean, where where is love? As a kid, is such a hard song to pitch. It's. I mean, I've I've choreographed a couple of productions of Oliver mm. since I'd done it. Done it, and every kid that's played Oliver has struggled with um, with pitching that song. 
and I, I look back at videos of me singing that and I just think, what am I doing? <laughs> and I had a speech impediment back then as well. I had a, a cleft palate. So I couldn't pronounce my S's. So all my S's were down my nose and I was out of tune. I just sounded... Not good. <laughs> and then Sylvia Young... Yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so I, had my, I had some reconstructive surgery on my palate. So I can now talk properly. <laughs> and Sylvia Young um, taught me an excellent vocal coach there called Ray Lamb. Um, who's just, he's amazing. He um, taught me some great technique. And I apply it every time I sing now. And then, of course, when I went to Conti, I got taught lots of different styles of singing and safe ways to sing in those styles from other teachers. And you actually have a Boy George tribute <laughs> yeah. as well. Yeah, I've just won an award, actually, for it. Yeah. Best tribute, 2019. Wow. Yeah. So I'm pleased with that. Has yeah. George seen it? Do you know what? I don't know. I've got him on. Um, I've got him on Twitter. So, do you know what? I've never been a massive fan of his, but someone told me that I sounded like him <laughs> when I was just doing a normal gig, mm. and um, and said, "Well, you could earn quite a bit of money <laughs> doing the tribute." So I was like, "Oh, I'll give that a go," and it seemed to have gone well this last year. It's, ta- it's taken a year to get it to where it is, but it, I'm getting some nice venues and things with it. So, yeah, yeah, it's good. Where's that taken you? It's taken... Uh, well, I sing in casinos and, and restaurants and bars and uh, 80s events. I did a festival in the summer. So it's great. It's great fun. And, of course, I'm not having to be myself. I'm playing a character. I struggle to go and do a gig just as myself. It's it's very odd. Whereas I can go and be Boy George and I can be as out there as him. <laughs> and what and what era of Boy George are we talking about? I, all the way through. All the way Cult, through. Culture Club, through all his solo stuff, to, to his most recent stuff, from his recent album. I cover it all. It depends on what the client wants. If it's an 80s weekend, they want 80s Boy George. So that's what I give them. Yeah. It's adaptable. Yeah, it's good fun. I enjoy it. Do you like the 80s music? I love the 80s. Do you know, I wish I was a teenager through the 80s. I would have absolutely loved it. I would have been full on, full romantic. (laughs) I'd have been, you know, I'd have been in the Blitz Club (laughs) in Soho. Well, Joe, this brings me on to my very last question. Yeah. Your dream... Panto, and I see you have a piece of paper in front of you, so you've been (laughs) deliberating. I I have been thinking long and hard about this. (laughs) So, for those listeners who... And I've got two. Am I allowed to do two? You can have two. Okay. You can have more than two if you want. But, um, yeah, for our listeners, it's... You choose the cast, the production, Alive or Dead, the people, and... You can be in it or sitting in the stalls watching it. So what, well, uh, what have you got lined up for us? Well, I'm, I'm definitely in the stalls watching it, without a doubt. Uh, the pan- uh, my first one is Cinderella. Okay. And as Cinderella, I've got Pixie Lot or Carrie Hope Fletcher. I think either of those two would be fabulous Cinderella's. There's just something about them as performers that is very, very charming, especially Carrie Hope Fletcher. I think she's wonderful mm. in everything that she does. Uh, as Buttons, I've got Rob Beckett, as in the comedian and presenter of All Together Now. I think he's fabulous. I think he'd be able to play that um, Nobody Loves Me, uh, Cinders Doesn't Love Me type pathos. I think mm. he'd be able to play that very well. Um... And I'd, I'd like to see him do some acting. As Ugly Sisters. Now, for this, I've got what I would have in, in a real world, in a realistic world, and what I would have in, like, a, a mad fantasy world. Right. So in my real world, Ugly Sisters, because I think they're both amazing dames, 
with amazing costumes are Andrew Ryan and Nigel Ellicott together as sisters I think would just be phenomenal and then in the fan- in the mad fantasy world I've got Divine and RuPaul oh. as the uglies they'd probably be more wicked sisters than ugly sisters mm. but I just think that that would be incredible if we could bring Divine back from the dead and put him together with RuPaul can I just remind you though of your thing about don't be a diva hey we um, very good might not not work (laughs) yeah well maybe maybe not no (laughs) be some tantrums backstage I'm sure Uh, but wouldn't they be fabulous on stage on and off on and off Absolutely. Sell tickets for backstage. Yeah. <laughs> Wicked stepmother. Kim Woodburn or Myra Dubois. Yeah. Good old Gareth. He'd Absolutely. Love that. He's, I saw him in Edinburgh mm. uh, the, last summer. He was brilliant. Absolutely fab- fabulous. Fairy godmother. I've got Jane Horrocks, but as Bubbles from Abfab. In that style. Mm. I think that would be hilarious. Uh, Baron Hardup, Tom Courtney, or Rudolph Walker, who is the actor who plays Patrick mm. on EastEnders. I think that would be very interesting to have him doing it in the in the um, Jamaican patois. I think that would be fabulous. Mm. Prince Charming, Chris Hemsworth. Dandini, Leighton Williams. I think he could give a really interesting uh, physical performance as Dandini. A bit like how Louis Spence has been doing. Mm. And then the, the, the palace entertainment in the ballroom scene would be Cirque du Soleil. Yeah. Where would be the venue? The Palladium. It has to be. Mm. <laughs> And for your second. And for my second one. Now, not everyone will know these first two castings. Um, well, or them, they might do. Because they're... I wouldn't say they're household names. But, you know, I'll, I'll explain as I go along. Mm. So for Aladdin, I've got an actor called George Salazar, who was just in a Broadway production called Be More Chill, and is now in a production in LA of Little Shop of Horrors and he's playing Seymour in that um, if you don't know him he's worth YouTubing because he's brilliant and he's, he would be my Aladdin opposite playing Princess Jasmine MJ Rodriguez who is uh, a trans actress who was just in Pose uh, The t- did you watch it? no I didn't it was a FX um series uh, and she is actually in that production of Little Shop with George Salazar playing Audrey together and there's a clip of them singing um, Suddenly Seymour on YouTube and I was watching it the other day and I thought firstly they sound amazing together and look amazing together and secondly wouldn't it be fabulous to have a trans principal girl I think that would just be Amazing. Uh, Twanky and Wishy. I've got the two Ronnies alternating roles nightly. Which I just think would be brilliant. Mm. Abanaza, Jeremy Irons or Ian McKellen. Um, Genie of the Lamp, Brian Blessed. Spirit of the Ring, Eartha Kitt. Chinese policeman Lauren and Hardy or Julian Barrett and Noel Fielding from The Mighty Boosh. I think that'd be quite interesting. Uh, Empress of China, Joan Rivers. How brilliant would that be? How brilliant would that be? And then again, the Royal Entertainment, Cirque du Soleil. That's my two lists. Well, thank you so much for taking part in the Panto podcast. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. And I uh, I love your podcast and I will continue to listen. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>